Hello, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the first of two panels where we're going to be talking about open banking. Now, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Helen, pleased to meet you, and I am the founder of Open Banking Excellence, OBE as we affectionately call it. OBE is now a global community of open banking pioneers, fintechs, big techs, banks, policymakers, regulators, all gathering around our community campfire to share their stories, to, to learn and importantly collaborate. So if anybody wants to have a chat to me about OBE, please um, you can find me on LinkedIn or you can have a look at our, our new website. Now, I'm hosting the first of two sessions um, and what we will be talking about is what APIs are doing for us all. So the impact they're having on our real lives and the discussion will look at open data, for individuals, businesses, and society as a whole. And then after 50 minutes, I'll be passing the mic to Hugh Davis, who is the co-founder and CEO of Ozone. And his expert panel will be continuing the discussion around open banking, looking more at the industry. Okay, so you are in for a real treat. Now, all of our experts are here today to share their knowledge, to inform and inspire. So I would ask that you join the conversation, you drop a, a few questions in chat for them, and I will make sure that they, they answer them for you. So please do get involved. Okay, so without further ado, let me introduce you to our panel today. Uh, ladies first, joining me shortly on the screen, we will have Claire. Claire Pearson is the Director of Open Banking and Payments at EPAM and she's got a huge depth of industry knowledge to share. And EPAM is probably the best kept secret. Claire, lovely to have you along with us today. Hello. Oh, thank you, Helen. Hello, and thank you to everyone. And um, nice to be here. Welcome for joining. Thank you. Uh, and you are joined by Ariel, who is the uh, CEO of um, Finexos. And that's a UK fintech um, that is making affordable credit accessible to the SMEs for those that hadn't previously been able to afford it. Now, they are really shifting the dial in financial inclusion. And during this panel session, we're going to be hearing about a lot of use cases that I can guarantee you've not heard before. So you want to listen up to what this man says. Ariel, pleased to meet you. And please say hello. Um, we're having a few technical issues. He uh, will join us in a moment. But if we move on to Brian, Brian Hamrahan, he will be joining us. Brian is the CEO of Newer Pay, and I am looking forward to what Brian has to say around payments. Newer Pay specialises in payments, and he has a whole treasure trove of um, uh, use cases to share. And we've got Ariel back with us as well. Hello. So, we're up. Yeah. Hello, but. Uh, right, we're off and racing. Okay, let's get started. So our first question, really to jump straight in there, is what is open banking? Okay, we all, we all hear about it, but what actually is it? Um, what was it intended to do? And what is it really doing for us now? How are we impacting? That was the, that was the exam question we had at the top. Okay, so if we have a look back, just to set a little bit of context, the CMA order came out in 2018. And let's have a look at where we've got to from 2018. And just to throw some figures to give you some size, the market is made up of 331 regulated entities, which is comprises of 238 third party processors. We love our acronyms, but we call them TTPs. Okay. Um, and that's 91 account providers of which, and I find this fascinating, 114 have regulated uh, uh, services in, in the market. And out of that 114, what we then have is 4 million individuals and businesses using open banking powered services. So open banking really has got traction in the market. So Brian, let's start with you. Open banking, what is it? What's it intended to do? It's all around payments at the moment, and that's what you guys specialize in. Please. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, yeah, so great to be here. Um, you know, look, we're, we're uh, coming at this from the uh, perspective as uh, kind of an infrastructure provider and payments uh, solution provider um, to uh, to uh, I suppose 
clients of our own directly, but also other TPPs um, who I'd label our platform. And then, um, you know, look, in, in the end, you know, I'd say what it boils down to is that open banking is about opening up and digitizing bank accounts and um, and the financial sector in general. And um, so, you know, the technical mechanism for doing that is is APIs, but, you know, but the core, you know, mission or purpose, you know, is really about that digitalization and, um, and introducing competition. You know, and um, the regulators who drove this into um, most markets really had that in mind. And um, so if you look at the competition of markets already in the UK, what they were trying to do is create more competition uh, between the banks. Um, you know, if you look at other markets, sometimes uh, regulators were driving uh, innovation to compete with the card schemes. Um, for, for various economic reasons, um, and, and that's kind of the the backdrop. Now, the, the good news is that the kind of standards and uh, the way uh, open banking has been designed, you know, um, allows for you know a thousand hours to flourish, right? So you can have all these different fintechs and um, payments companies and, and other players build it products on top of that kind of core uh, infrastructure and core standard. And that's where you kind of see some of these really interesting uh, use cases um, get get picked up. So I think that's kind of, um, that's the key. The, the other thing we, we certainly see is, you know, open banking is kind of interweaving with another global trend, which is the move towards real time account to account payments. And, and those two things really complement each other and um, to just you know, create all these new possibilities for improvement and modernization of, uh, of the industry. It's interesting, Brian, that you, you talked about the difference between uh, a regulated approach, which we in the UK took, and, and the UK created the, the blueprint, as, as we know, for open banking, and other markets take a more market-adopted approach. So I'm interested in hearing from Claire, because Claire, mm -hmm. you work for a, a global company. I said it was the best-kept secret. So your take on open banking and, and what it is, I'd love to hear your perspective, please. Yes, of course, Helen. Yeah, so we see different requirements from different clients around the world. So predominantly the standards that we've you know, used in the UK and what we can now see is different markets within open banking, looking at some of the UK elements and almost um, blueprinting some of the better traps that can to avoid some of the mistakes that were made on the UK, shall we say. Um, and, you know, we can see that kind of coming together. I think it's, a, it's definitely a future question for later on in the panel, but how that um, interoperability, you know, fits together quite well and how it's going to work in Canada because we're working on the we have a lady that represents um, in Canada called Michelle Bayo that sits on the OBIC and so she's helping the, um, the Canadian and the Canadian government kind of form what that's going to look like as a proposition and then we're also obviously we sit on the Brazil ones as well and we see Australia as kind of the next piece that we we'll also have clients involved in as well so as we come together I think there could be a real um, major shift worldwide you know and everyone has just talked about Brian's just mentioned about global real-time payments great yeah if we can get to that position globally that might be a future question for later on in the panel though we, yeah for us we definitely see that sorry we, we can certainly cover that we will do it is interesting and um, michelle has actually spoken at uh, one of our, our campfires and i'll give her a little bit of a shout out you know she uh, we always at ob believe she's passing the mic to a female she is awesome she really she is, is awesome. great yeah they're, they're having to have a quite a bit of uh, patience and tenacity in in canada at the moment aren't they yeah they are yeah there's a bit of difficulty to get traction there was a bit of difficulty to get it off the ground you know she's done a lot of work with the government as well to kind of bring them on board and with the businesses as well to get them to understand even what open banking is and then to be able to drive it forward and move it forward a bit like we have done on, on europe and the uk so looking at those standards and looking at what can be incepted and what can be built from the outset has been great and michelle's a really advocate for that Canada so I can only see it um, moving forward really well. well. We'll make sure she sees this when she's away. We will, we'll have to play um, it back. <laughs> and you mentioned uh, Brazil, when we had our, mm -hmm. our campfire and um, we've just recently launched in Brazil, Ariad, um, Aristides um, from the Central Bank of Brazil said that the UK was all about lessons learned and they had actually come to the UK and spoken to the CMA9 to learn um, and, and their, their rate of market adoption has really accelerated that. So I think we're in a very privileged position and we should be very, very proud of, of what we've created in, in, in the UK. It really is a, a moment in time, a very special moment in time. But, but moving on, because he's also got a, a lot of other stories to share about other parts of the world. Ariel, I'm curious, open banking, what does it mean for your business? And, and what's your take on it all, please? 
Well, it, it'll, in short, it allows us to do something that we've had a lot of success with uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, I, lead a t uh, I lead a company called Nexus that has a solution that makes it possible for both people and small businesses to access credit at affordable rates, despite having no credit history or, or for credit problems in the past. And we do that on the basis of their cash flow, rather than looking at traditional you know, income or, or, or you know, whether or not you've made payments on debts, things that many people in the, in the world, even if they're good risks, can't prove. Uh, we did this in Kenya, and the results that we, we uh, achieved there uh, were phenomenal. We, uh, working through uh, their uh, world-leading payment solution in PESA, uh, we, made it, we, we allowed the number of people who qualified for credit uh, in a country of 40 million people to move from a peak of 500 a day to 50,000 a day. Um, while doing that, we outperformed their, their existing credit models, were all FICO-based. Uh, so we actually, despite not knowing if somebody was employed, how they'd done on past debts, we were able to outperform FICO by 26%. Um, so, I mean, and that, you know, that's a very provocative statement in saying, we can look at somebody's payments, their, their, you know, their current account transaction history, people or small business, don't know their income, don't know whether they've had a loan before, don't know if they were a deadbeat on the last 12 loans they applied for. Uh, in many cases, because KYC in Kenya is sketchy at best, we don't even know their name, but we can outperform FICO by 26%, um, just looking at that data. Now in Kenya, that was easy to do because we were working with M-Pesa. 40% of the GDP of the country flows through it. So we had a single data source and that was enough for us to do this inference. In a mature market, that's not going to work. Open banking makes it possible for us to deliver this, you know, and this is counterintuitive. It lay, open banking makes it possible for us to deliver the same kind of financial inclusion you can get in the developing world in a mature economy. It's absolutely fascinating, and I'm um, old enough to remember M Pesos. And I mean, see, I was my background is is, is mobiles, and uh, I was uh, involved in the very in the launch of that project. So. Um, Brilliant to hear it merging with, with with open banking, which is a lovely lead on then, okay, um, to our next question, because we want to look at the, the user cases and the impact, and we've heard some, you know, a, a fascinating tale there. Um, but so let's look at um, how, closer to home, how the pandemic, okay, has allowed um, open banking uh, to flourish. So let's focus on our user cases. Um, so, so Claire, and we said at the top, we would look at some unusual use cases. So I know you've got a great one around airline and, and risk. Please share. I have, yes, this is a, a perfect example of what we can do um, on APIs actually. So then we built um, a, a brand new airline risk tool, not really um, done in the market before, but the building of this tool, it allowed us to bring in enhanced flight data using an API to connect to the airline systems. So essentially what we did is pull all of that flight information in. When the flight has flown, we could pull in additional information such as baggage, OTAs, you know, where they've um, got online travel agency um, additional services that they've added. We could pull all of that in with upgrades, even at the airport, and we could use that information to basically fund the right accounts to the merchant. So essentially we can make sure from a merchant perspective, the cash flow was protected during the pandemic because as we know, during the pandemic, airlines travel was particularly um, suffered, you know, quite quite substantially, really. So it was around that risk element, but also enabling them to, to keep going and to keep trading until they're back flying. So this was a massive piece and we did the implementation on open banking using APIs in about six to eight weeks. So it was kind of the fastest one we've ever done as well. But without that API connectivity, you know, these are, they would have been a project probably would have run for six to eight months at least to do something like this in the past. So it just shows that flexibility and the agility that we had with the API connectivity in the middle. So definitely a really good, a really good story for us in terms of that build. A brilliant story and a brilliant use case around agility. Um, Brian, you must have so many to share payments um, in the pandemic. Where to start? <laughs> yeah, look, so I think, um, you know, the, the pandemic um, certainly kind of accelerated the shift away from like physical plastic cards and you know obviously physical cash you know people really were quite uncomfortable with that with 
touching a card machine, keying it in, uh, keying in your PIN number, you know, uh, on, on a shared device. So one of the use cases that we we saw was actually people uh, doing something we didn't really expect to happen much, um, you know, using open banking payments in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, and um, and the form that took was we had um, you know, partners who were working with uh, chains of restaurants and restaurants uh, around the country providing a QR code experience for ordering food. Um, and then, you know, because open banking payments are kind of a mobile native um, you know, experience, you can then kind of click straight through into the payment um, you know, without having to touch any other device but your own mobile phone. Okay. And it's a really kind of seamless experience. So we kind of saw that, you know, pay with your own device, um, avoiding the card, um, and obviously the rekeying of card data um, by the, the consumer. You know, all of that disappears with open banking because you can simply authenticate using biometrics and uh, and click click the payment uh, through without any further data entry so it's um that that really kind of took off during the pandemic so open banking uh, right now is, is focused a, a great deal on payments do you think that the pandemic has, has accelerated that market adoption what's your take on that brian yeah, I think it has. Yeah, so I, I think um, you know it, it it generally accelerated electronic payments because just cash kind of you know became less of a factor, and I think it moved people on to digital services, digital subscriptions. You know, people were buying their groceries online much more. They were subscribing to a you know food boxes and and these kind of you know at home meals and so on. So you know we we just generally saw a pickup on um, you know transaction activity. We we power direct debits for some of the big. TV streaming companies, um, one of the big uh, um, children's channels in that space, which saw a massive spike in activity because everybody was locked down at home and kids were um, not at school. So um, <laughs> maybe that became more popular. But um, yeah, so you just generally saw a, a, a massive pickup and then uh, to move away from physical cards as much as possible. Fascinating. Uh, Ariel, I see you nodding your head. The pandemic, how, how has it affected your business, please? Um, it, it's actually given us uh, a lot of traction and a lot of focus. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of embarrassing to say because people are really suffering. Um, but it's it's highlighted the need for what we've been doing. I mean, you know, we saw it coming before the pandemic. Uh, obviously, it's this week. Uh, Mark Fisher, our founder, has been working on this idea for for over, over six years now. Um, but um, so I mean, we saw this coming. But it's highlighted just how fragile. Uh, most mature economies are in terms of people caught in, particularly in the revolving credit trap and in how hard it is for um, SMEs to gain access to, to growth capital. And again, we can take a key lesson from, uh, from a, a developing economy, Tanzania in this case. They did a study that looked at single person businesses uh, that were successful. So in over a two and a half year period in Tanzania, uh, 2% of all single person businesses grew to successful companies of 10 employees or more. So 2%. That 2% created over 25% of all new jobs in the country. So imagine if by making growth capital available to small businesses, uh, even micro single person businesses, we can get that 2% to 3%. Even a small change would be truly transformational in terms of the impact it has. Transformational. That is, I think, what we're all working for in, in, in open banking, which is a lovely segue. Um, so thank you for that. Into our next question. So the FCA has had their, their import for, for open banking, their, their call for import, um, which um, <clears throat> I, I'm, um, I'm not sure whether Claire and Brian um, were involved in, but we'll, we'll find out in a moment. And, and it's open, open for, so we're, we're now looking from open banking to open finance and open data and beyond, um, led by our, our regulators. So it's all about opening up the economy, econ economy even. Um, so open finance, what is it? So we asked that question about open banking and we got under the skin a little there. Um, but let's look under the bonnet at open finance, what, what it is and what we think it is going to be. So Claire, I would like to start with you. Um, I quoted some figures from Tanzania around the world. Uh, it's a lovely segue, as I said, for you to talk about your, your consumer banking report, please. Open yes. finance, tell us more. 
Yes, definitely. So we did um, a survey, we performed a survey in 2020 um, on consumer banking and then we redid that survey in 2021 because as we know things had moved on in that year so quite quite dramatically as well in that time and we surveyed just on 21,000 consumers across the globe. So this was in the UK, in the US, Hong Kong, Netherlands, Germany, Singapore and Canada that were included in that report and we took different segments of, of, of consumers and what we found in particular about the younger consumers, we made the assumption that, um, well, we made the assumption that uh, younger consumers would, would go for the digitized uh, version of things. But actually, as it turned out on some of the, the report, what we had, some of the results were really interesting because they actually showed the younger age group. So our 18 to 44 year olds came out as needing someone to help them through certain life journeys. And, part of that was around mortgages so when they got to a certain age um you know they didn't feel comfortable doing certain things online and some of that came out in the report where they needed that advice and they needed that that s expert really to kind of help them through that and um, mainly the ones who didn't really have a parent or guardian you know to kind of drive that area for them and help them um, understand so we thought that was really interesting because the question we asked was what do bank customers really want and the research told us actually part of that that the human touch wasn't dead and then also different products apart from banking. So it came out around mortgages we've mentioned, but also around pensions, it came out about life insurance. So we had this other um, area opening up into open finance. And that was you know, something for us that we kind of expect were payments, you know, we, we, we live and breathe payments. So we didn't really expect that to come out as the flavor it did in the report. So that does lead us nicely into that open finance question. There are kind of three real clear emerging trends that we found in the report. And one was around um, the unbundling of financial services. That was kind of our, our number one trend. People are starting to not switch, but supplement their account. So supplementing their account with different models of, of finance. We've talked about some of them there then around pensions and finance and mortgages and so on. And the second part that came out was around the consumer thirst for information. So they really want to know about um, open banking. They really want to know about open finance and what it can bring to them as part of their life as well. So not just around a product piece and a product sale, but what does it mean to them? And then the third um, trend we, we came out with really was to look at the behavior and the change and how banks need to overcome some of the the, the cynicism really around um, the, the, the old legacy kind of bank model that we had previously. But yeah, open finance, just to link that back into that, that was kind of really key in our consumer banking reports. It wasn't just about banking. It really very clearly came out in that report about other products and services that especially the younger group were interested in. That it's helped. interesting you're talking about more wider consumer uh, choice. Mm -hmm. um, Brian, I wonder if you could jump in now. Um, you've got a, a great use case um, uh, for, for one banks to share, which I would I'd love you to, to talk about. Um, but also just the wider question, open finance, is it is it really going to en enhance um, the, the consumer choice? We all think it will. What do you think? Yeah, so I suppose we um, yeah kind of start off with the one banks example. Yeah. So one banks is a is a fintech um, that um, you know, we, we support as a partner, and um, you know basically what they've um, what they identified was that um, much like Claire has uh, Claire's report has also confirmed is that you know a lot of people do need that kind of you know face to face support when they go to use banking services right so traditionally they've gone to you know there's parts of the population who've gone to a bank branch and um, you know uh, particularly in rural areas bank branches are shutting at a, a very kind of uh, fast rate now um, and that has you know issues and creates problems for local businesses you know who need to take some cash for example you know or also people who are kind of you know maybe uh you know not geared up to to access digital services only and, and need a, a kind of a face-to-face a -face, um you know service um channel so um so with with open banking one banks is basically building these shared serviced uh kiosks or branches you know where somebody can access multiple banks from from one location or whichever bank they're with you know they can access it from that one bank's uh, location so great great financial inclusion uh, use case there and, and also kind of you know they're increasingly getting into supporting kind of more than just day-to-day -day banking but also that kind of uh, other products that, that, that Claire's touched on I think in terms of open finance in general like yeah you know, so my uh, you know my, my view is it's 
really that were just in the foothills were probably one percent done on open banking and open finance you know and um you know we we lived in a world of silos um you know uh, up until now basically where you know each business serviced their clients from their own proprietary shop front or channel you know, so if you went to bank A, you would go to their internet banking channel and log in and do everything. You know, bank B, you would have to do the same thing, but with a new channel and a new password. You know, that 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 doesn't need to be the case anymore. We're you know we're moving into a kind of interconnected you know uh, uh, platform based uh, you know world where whoever the platform you use uh, will tap into you know other services in the background. And I think yeah, Claire mentioned unbundling. We we see the same thing now whether the platforms and, and who's going to win that battle you know, will be a kind of a gaffer. So like, you know, is it going to be Google, you know, or is it going to be your bank, you know, for these services or somebody else? We, we don't know. Right. But, um, you know, uh, our, our view and you know, my expectation is that, you know, you can kind of, you can see that's already happening. You know, we're already seeing kind of software vendors, you know, taking, you know, uh, products like ours to allow payment activities to happen inside an accounting package, you know, or any kind of a funds management or a wealth management package. And um, and that's just going to increase now that open finance opens up pension pots and insurance products and, and moves beyond just the current account to all these other kind of areas. And, and that platformification um, is, is just going to build. Uh, that I think is a macro trend that we're all going to have to deal with over the next 10, 20 years. So certainly they're um, enhancing consumer choice, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so like, I suppose it's a, it's a tricky, tricky game, right? So like, you know, the, you've got to, you'll have all these products, you know, but of course, then you kind of get tied in a little bit to the platform environment. Like if you have an Apple, you know, you can use Apple apps. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, there, there will be a bit of a power struggle here, but I think consumers will be able to access financial services in a much more decoupled uh, way than, uh, than they can today. Before we go to Ariel, Claire, I'm just wanting you to sort of jump back in. Do you have anything yeah. to, to add there? Because I know you've done a huge amount of work in this area. Yeah, and I agree with Brian and you know entirely on what he's just said there about the unbundling, and we have seen this across the you know the different sectors as well. But we also provide support and solutions to our clients. We build technology solutions globally, so we can see the need coming from them as well. And it's definitely this unbundling pieces in there, you know. But equally, you haven't the need for five apps anymore. You know, you, you, as Brian's just said, then you don't need to go into each bank app to basically perform. You know. You, you look at your account or can I get a request? Can I do a balance? Can I look at insurance? I mean, my, myself, I've got a real good use case that like your pension now is showing on your banking app because they're part of the same business behind. So you actually can see how much potentially I'm going to look at retirement. It might be a good or a bad thing, but you can actually see it there every day. So, you know, it's starting to go that way. I think the question probably will come later on as to how that um, is managed going forward with this unbundling. Is it almost, do we need a provider to kind of patchwork it back together maybe? I don't know. That's one to watch for the future, I think there. I think that the whole open finance market is one to watch for the future. It certainly um, is exciting and, and, you know, open banking, you know, is it, it's, it's predominantly around payments. That's where, you know, the, the CMA order has, has focused on and, and OBIE's work ha has focused on. And as we move into, as, as Brian was saying, pensions, wealth management, uh, and insurance, it, get, it does get phenomenally exciting. It gives us all power over our data and far more consumer choice, which is a lovely lead into Ariel. And I know you've had a few technical issues. So um, how you, your take on open finance, you know, you've got an amazing uh, backdrop to start from in what you're doing with consumer credit and financial inclusion. I'd love to hear more from you around what you're going to be doing in open finance, how you think it's going to shift the dial for consumer choice, please. So what open finance does is it allows us to take, to take the next step. You know, as we saw in Kenya, and as we're starting to see now with, with our pilots in, in the, here in the UK, open banking lets us prop, you know, make credit at, at, at reasonable rates, rates that help people rather than harm them. Um, uh, uh, available to people despite have you know previous uh, credit performance or lack thereof. That's a great start. You know, there's there's over 27 million people caught in the revolving credit trap now. So with open banking alone, we can get them there. But at this point, it's reactive. We are all we all, all we're doing now is doing a better job of assessing somebody's current financial capability. What we can do with open finance is actually start helping people proactively improve that capability. You know, 18 million people in the UK have no savings account. That's, you know, that's absurd. 
um, and it's you know, it's behavioral. It's in response to you know to to, to media triggers. There, you know, there's lots of reasons for that, uh, well beyond you know even the you know the lofty of our of our ambitions to solve. But what we can do with open finance is we can give people to, tools to say, okay, so this is your access to credit at affordable rates now, based on the combination of spending, behavioral, what have you. Now with open finance, here's what you can do to change that. So you can basically start taking charge uh, of your own financial capability by understanding the levers, by gaining access to savings, by understanding how the things that you do actually impact your financial capability on a day-to-day -day basis. Open finance really opens a Pandora's box in terms of proactively letting people um, change, their, change their financial destinies um, in a way that, you know, that is still, I'm sorry to say, largely class stratified by now. You know, now. Yeah, actually, I just maybe add on, on that. Like, I think um, one thing people um, kind of, I suppose, assume, you know, from, um, you know, kind of um, unbundling is that it's going to be bad news for uh, for banks. Um, and you know, look, there'll be parts where that may be the case. But, you know, if, if you think of another case scenario here where, for example, Ariel has developed the product and you described it in Kenya, you know, as um, having a kind of a better ability to assess credit than, you know, than traditional uh, tools um, you know, made possible. Well, even if you're a, a kind of a, a major high street bank in the UK, if you can tap into that product, potentially you can use your balance sheet to distribute those loans, you know, and, and this is, um, you know, kind of expanding the pie, not just redistributing it between, you know, between people. So you know, I think it's, um, you know, it, it, it's a really kind of, Kind of dynamic scenario where you've got some kind of areas where there's competition but equally kind of you know uh, even banks and and you know more incumbent uh, financial providers can win you know from a from a lot of these um technologies interesting claire this is a fascinating conversation uh, is there anything you want to add to this the whole as we open up into the whole open finance era go on yeah i think as well that you know brian's just talked about it there but the the new set of service providers so there's also more opportunity here as well so if we you know if we're open open finance you've got new um providers we probably wouldn't have have thought about we've all probably worked at, uh, at some of the major banks previously and it was kind of limited into that cma9 whereas now this has given so much opportunity for the fintechs and startups to to kind of have that service provider and be a provider for a bank as well so we're talking about this third party middle we've talked about the TPPs earlier, but the third party model and how that can be really an opportunity for these guys as well to kind of step in and be that service provider. So the unbundling is one piece, but giving people an opportunity as part of that financial inclusion piece, we're also putting the economy back into some of these small businesses and, and fintechs and startups and giving them that, that, that chance as well. Ariel, please, do you want to comment on that? Because it is a fascinating ecosystem, isn't it? Well, yeah, I, I think Claire Claire's nailed it. They, the, you know, the, the key thing that drives what Claire was saying, actually also what Brian was saying as well, is about transparency. Uh, what it does is it, is it lets people understand how their finances really work. It democratizes it, if you will. Um, and it gives them choices, options. Uh, they can make, you know, uh, try understanding, try to go to an aggregator site and compare different mortgage offers or even different broadband offers. Um, it's it's virtually impossible to do an apples to apples comparison between pricing models and you know payment schemes and so forth. Open finance allows innovators to develop ways of actually presenting you know people's financial options around savings, around pensions, around insurance, um, using a common denominator, using a way that makes sense, and really allows them to take charge of what they're able to do. And it's the transparency that makes that possible. It's the, the transparency of the data and, and it's, it's interesting because both um, Claire and Brian have touched on this. It's, it's the ecosystem with banks and uh, fintechs in some areas competing. It's a, it's a very dynamic ecosystem, isn't it, Claire? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. And, you know, seeing that, having worked at some of the, the major banks previously, there was a definite shift, I would say, around five or six years ago where, you know, for us, it was looking at other opportunities and on other providers. This was probably something banks had never done before. You know, we've built everything on a legacy system. So it was what, how else can we make this really flexibility back to that agility and flexibility, but the transparency piece in there with a service provider that can actually do it really well. You know, if the bank doesn't need to do it, you know, 
bring someone in that in that, that can and using APIs is a massive way to connect that that piece of connectivity and actually communication as well it opens up the data still some questions around which data I think the banks are trying to get their heads around how much data they can expose um, but yeah you know it, it will definitely make it more seamless I think with these other service providers in there as well as another layer if you think we're, we're at year three now, and if you think, you know, the, the numbers I quoted at the, at the top and, you know, four million user cases, you know, it, it's sorry. Um, yeah, for um, for um, four million transactions, that's what it was a month. Sorry. Um, but but uh, it, it's, it's amazing how we've grown as a market, do you not think, and how um, how we all do tend to cooperate and, and compete. It's, it's actually a topic that Gio, who's our head of uh, research, has uh, got a, a first guy to have a PhD in open banking, and he actually wrote his thesis on this because it, it, it is unusual. And there is a real, we're in a real moment in time creating what is actually quite a special um, ecosystem. Um, it is, it's, it's fascinating. And, and that's a, a lovely segue into what I want to talk to us um, about next is the future and what the market can expect. A little bit of crystal ball gazing now. I'm going to put you on the spot. So over the next uh, 18, 24 months, Ariel, I would love your sort of predictions on financial inclusion. You talked about democratizing data. Um, what's, what's it all going to look like? What can we be, you know, expecting in the next 18, 24 months, please? Well, in Kenya, when we did this, um, over five years, the GDP per capita of the country nearly doubled. 2% of people were lifted out of poverty. Um, so initially, uh, we can talk. We, we can talk about results like that. Um, you know, there's there's an astonishing number of people with limited access uh, to you know to the change in lives that affordable credit. And I'm not talking about Wanga or your payday lenders here, but that affordable credit makes possible. Uh, so I think we you know, I, I am uh, perhaps um, uncharacteristically very optimistic uh, about. Uh, what these you know these technologies and this transformative ability uh, makes possible, but really that's the that, that's only the start. What we can then do start doing is actually talking about uh, financial product innovation on a scale that we've never seen. In Turkey, um, and I'm just going to pick pick an example here. Uh, they're now giving loans to farmers uh, mortgages. That allow them to 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 grow their businesses by saying, um, you know, because a farmer only has two cash flow events in in the year, uh, a cash outlay when they um, you know when, when they plant and, and a cash you know, influx when they harvest. So they've now designed mortgages that uh, basically are interest only ten months of the year, zero payments at all when you plant, and all of your your capital of retirement on the month when you harvest, uh, which has fundamentally transform the agricultural sector. Now, this is just one example. What, what, what open banking and open finance will do will provide acceleration and the ability to have this kind of, um, uh, you know, this kind of financial innovation, but with the speed to market that you currently only expect in say mobile phones um, and, and, and make your know, innovation at pay, scale and at pace uh, a direct possibility by opening up um, access to customers to anybody who's smart enough and who can go through regulatory due diligence. Fascinating, it is actually. So um, you talk about Turkey there, Brian. Let's look a little closer to home. What's uh, you know, what's your forecast? What's it going to look like in eighteen months? Maybe twenty four is, is too far out. Let's have a. Let's, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to learn more. Yeah. So. I suppose let's, let's you know just start off with Europe here, and um, you know so I think if you um, split Europe versus the UK, I would say the UK started about eighteen months before Europe, so it's probably still about that far ahead. And and where you know the UK is, I would say is you know we're now moving into what I would kind of class as the beginnings of like mainstream adoption on open banking payments, and um, so you know four million people you know. Are, using it you know where i think we're moving in now to some major um, brand name rollouts right so you've now seen you know the uk government's you know um uh, tax arm hmrc and um, has now rolled out open banking payments for people to make uh, make their tax payments and um, you're seeing more and more major merchants um you know doing that across 
banking, financial services, uh, subscription businesses, and so on. You know, and um, I think you know that that's kind of that, that's key. Like one of the things we can pretty you know tell uh, as a signal that this is moving from the very early adopters to to more the kind of uh, early majority or mainstream is that. We're now kind of getting inquiries and inbound, um, you know, uh, interest from businesses that not are not only are just kind of wondering what open banking is and want to know about it, but actually they're, they're looking for a very specific benefit, usually because they've seen one of their competitors implement open banking and gain an advantage, you know, um, and either on their customer experience or selling experience or costs or whatever, you know, and um, and that, that kind of to me is a big signal. You know that um, you know we're now moving into the next stage of adoption. I'm I'm curious on the payment side, which is what uh, New Pay are absolutely specialists at. Um, where where will payments go, Brian? I'd like your insight there. We have you know variable recurring payments, VRP as we yeah uh, we call it. You know where, where's all that going to go? What what sort of trajectory are we on? Yeah, so it's um. It, it's a really interesting kind of uh, thing to look at other countries where you know this kind of payment method has been around for a while so you know before we called it open banking the the, the netherlands has been doing basically open banking payments for about 10 to 15 years with their ideal payment method which is a direct bank um, transfer and um, using the same methods uh, basically that open banking employs now in the netherlands um ideal has market share of about 65 percent of e-commerce payments and that took them a while to get there and there's various local circumstances to drive that but you know i think in the uk and other countries where they're a bit more card centric to, you know historically it'll take a few years to kind of build up this this share and um, what we see though that kind of uh, is a really interesting leading indicator is you know when a merchant puts this payment option on the menu you know, we do see an awful lot of customer appetite to to choose it. Um, so you'll see anything from 10 to 50 percent of consumers choosing to pay this way. And probably more importantly, once somebody has done it once <clears throat> and they've gone through that experience, which is really kind of slick on mobile, it's probably the best payment experience out there. Um, they tend to kind of choose it again the next time they come around and, and that's you know like a 90 percent um yeah. you know uh, re return rate to the payment method so that that all bodes really well for this to just build up now it's going to take time because men merchants are just putting it on the menu and payment service providers are just putting this option on the menu you know and, and you know, lots of them are in different stages of the rollout for people like us but um yeah that's yeah th th that bodes well into the next you know two five years that's exactly the type of traction we want to see uh, at home and, and, and abroad. Now, Claire, mm -hmm. um, it's the abroad bit that I would like us to, to focus on because we do have a, a global audience tuning in. Yep. Um, talk, talk to me more globally. Yeah. Globally, yeah, no, a really good link there, Brian. I know you've mentioned uh, Ideal there, but one of the one of the things I was going to talk about actually is what we'd seen in Singapore. So some of the research we did um, on the report I just referred to earlier was examples of Singapore respondents who were quite different than the rest of the market globally. So 64% of those guys said they would open an account with a bank they, they did not know, they're not familiar with, they didn't know. Um, and in the Netherlands, it was around 33% in Dutch respondents. So this is because they're so familiar with Ideal. They have that bank-to-bank -bank account transfer already in place. So we saw a massive difference between different areas that we surveyed. Um, and the other big part we haven't really touched on in this panel, but we talked um, about crypto as well. So this was another piece, a massive piece in our Gen Z that came out. It's about 64% of 18 to 24 year olds and 55% of millennials, which we didn't expect, were also willing to to consider crypto as well so you know it, globally there's a definite shift i think vrp is really exciting if that was a global proposition to get a global real-time payment would be you know phenomenal across all the open banking markets and again i know it's going to be just the mandated sweeps at first but to see that moving forward you can see 18 to 24 months it's quite easy visionary to, to kind of move that into a global state as well but very different depending on the market we surveyed so there's some really good results in the report so recommend if anyone wants to see it we can post it in there they can have a little look through the report themselves well first of all do do, do post it okay so much in that reply i want to come back in first of all crypto <laughs> uh we've uh, uh had a, our first crypto campfire and we're probably going to be having one a quarter 
and we are doing, we've done a, a crypto 101 just to, to to sort of demystify the jargon because you know I need to, I need to get down there with the kids because it's it's a whole different world but there is something really exciting seriously now with the convergence between open banking and crypto happening and again that's another moment in time it's it's happening now a year ago when we actually seriously talked about doing that you would never have had open banking and crypto in the same conversation with any real credibility now um, there is there is something happening there and there is a, a real convergence of the two you touched on vrp uh which which i know is is something very uh close to, to, to brian's heart but before we go back to that and, and let him add a little there um because i actually think that's a real game changer i'd like you claire just to touch and we are coming to, to the end but to, to talk about australia you know the uh -huh. consumer di consumer data rights data <laughs> good accent now. Good <laughs> we're not very good at accents then <laughs> um <laughs> australia is a, it is very different market so you know we have a team in, in australia and the guys are really experienced we're working with mpp um on the new payments platform at the moment into what that can look like and again open banking is going to be the next piece there it's it's huge in terms of card transactions at the moment but how do we move and shift some of that into the open banking world and that's something we're really focused on for the australian market is a very different market um, the, we also have a lot of APMs as well so the alternative payment methods that sit out there as well and there's lots of really good talents we're seeing coming through so yeah I think Australia is, is, is a very different one they could probably spend longer talking about MPP but there's there's so much more to come I think in Australia especially yeah it's, it, it's a very big and growing market for us in fact we've just literally opened another office there so you can see where the, where the markets were already shifting in that space so I think they're also following some of the open banking models from the UK as well. It it's, it's always goes back to what we were saying before, it, it's lessons learned. Brian, would you like to add in, in because I know that you um, you, you have a, a operations down under. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we've recently been acquired by uh, EMR Payments, which is a, an Australian stock exchange listed uh, payments business. So yeah, so we're, we're um, much more actively uh, involved uh, there these days. And yeah, look, I think it's it's a data-led uh, country, regulatory-led, but they have a, a payments layer now being added uh, called Pay2, um, and it's quite an advanced um, standard, which is pretty you know, pretty complete. So you know, over the next kind of couple of years, I think I think the same kind of traction that we've seen in Europe is uh, is likely there. You know, so that's um, that, that's it. I think you mentioned Helen about just uh, VRP or variable yeah. recurring payments. So this is this kind of long lived consent um, you know, model for payments. Um, yeah, look, we, we again think it's a uh, you know it, it's a great introduction into open banking. It opens up use cases dramatically. Um, I suppose to, to start with, it's it's kind of limited to what's called a sweeping use case so me moving money between my my accounts and um, but uh, i think if we go back to you know even financial inclusion and, and products and um, this allows people to now source and um, potentially let's say an overdraft from a, a different lender than their core you know high street bank and um, you know and compete on that basis and i'm sure Ariel has kind of uh, thoughts on, on that as well but that's exactly what vrp also facilitates not just the data but now the practical movement of money underneath it yeah. It is a real game yeah. changer. It's a lovely. Go on, jump in. That's exactly what I was going to ask, Ariel. Go on. So no, I, and, and this is actually to your point. So bringing it from uh, a very optimistic future to the here and now. Here in the UK, currently, we've got all of these energy companies that are folding, uh, and normally, as a, as a consumer, um, you have the right to go. You know, regardless of what your contract says, you can go pick a new energy provider. Um, however, if you're a consumer with account accounts in arrears. You can't do that. You're not allowed to. So again, uh, the people who need that, that that flexibility the most are the people who don't get it. Um, this is exactly the kind of thing that open banking and open finance can fix in the here and now. Uh, and it's what we're actively working on. And that is a, a, a brilliant place to start wrapping it up as we've got two minutes. And I know API days do have a, a packed schedule. Um, gosh, we could have that. We, you know, if we were down the pub, this conversation would have gone on for Go a lot longer. Wouldn't it? It really <laughs> would. Okay. So, and, and finally, as um, if you're old enough to remember, those are famous uh, uh, lines uh, used at News at Ten. And finally, okay, um, if you were to give one piece of advice, okay, to somebody that was joining 
um, open banking, open finance, what would that be? And, you know, we're looking at a market that the growth trajectory is just phenomenal. So everybody has a day one, okay? Um, and and I, I, I see this on our team, okay? So Claire, your one piece of advice to somebody that was joining this industry on day one, what would it be, please? Day one would be open mind. I know that's really into open banking, but open mind, be really curious, be really um, inquisitive about things and, you know, link things together. I'm quite visual, so I like to see things drawn out, but, you know, wh whichever way works for you, just really ask the questions. Open mind. I might, uh, wow. might plagiarise that one. Well done, Claire. <laughs> right, Brian, your one piece of advice, because you must see a lot of new starters at NeuroPay. Yeah, yeah. Look, so, um, yeah, look, I think, you know, APIs, open banking, that they, you know, they're, they're actually just new technology. So I think the, the key piece of advice is just focus on a customer need, you know, and work back from that, you know, and I think um, all of these technologies allow us to address them uh, in new ways and maybe do something smart, but it's really just to focus on that need. Always bring it back to the customer. And Ariel, to wrap it up, your, your one piece of advice. Well, my, uh, just to, I'm trying to give practical advice, due diligence. Don't think that just because um, regulators uh, move, don't move as fast as you do, that you are somehow special or exempt. Uh, make sure that you are aligning with both the, the letter and the spirit of what people who are charged to protect consumers uh, are do, because they will catch up. Um, and you know, have your ducks in a row, understand how what you're doing is compliant with you know, the letter, the spirit, and the direction of, uh, of where regulators are going so that you don't have a great business model destroyed from the inability to launch it. Fascinating way to finish actually, because we, we all operate in a game changing market where we make a, a real impact, which was the, the exam question at the beginning, the impact on people's lives, but we all do operate in a regulated environment. So beautiful way to finish and uh, something we should all be very mindful of. All that remains for me is to very sadly bring this to a close because I wish it could, could have gone on a lot longer. So I would like to thank our panel, Claire, Brian, Ariel. You've absolutely been super generous with your expertise. And I, for one, would love to get um, you all back at Open Banking Excellence and, and talk around our campfire because there's a lot more here. I wish we had more time to unpack. But for now, thank you very, very much. And what we can do, this, this recording will be going out live and um, as it is now, but we will be sharing it. Um, so you can always catch up and, and share it with everybody else at, um, at API Days. And Claire's going to post that report as well, aren't you, Claire? I am. Thank so, you. Thank you very, very much, guys. I enjoyed that. It was fun. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.